Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity hosted by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the social studies specialist for the state. Uh, today, this morning, we are lucky to have India um, Meisel. She's from Virginia. I know her. She's an eighth grade uh, social studies teacher. I know her as uh, she's now the past president. Eighth grade? Ninth grade? Well, 12, 11 and 12. Why do I, have, I put eighth grade somewhere. Okay, she's a 12th grade. She's a high school social studies teacher. I put you on for eighth grade for some reason. Um, uh, but where I know her as is the, she's now the past president of the National Council for Social Studies. Um, India is one of those very, very kind people that as I wander around my national network when she was president and I stood in awe of the greatness of India, she was very nice. She came and she pulled me aside and just said, Joe, it's okay. I will always be your hero. And she was, she didn't actually say that. India's been very wonderful. Um, she is a leader in the social studies field and has always been very, very kind to me. And we see that again as she's here today to share her expertise with Maine educators. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to India. Good morning, everybody. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a lucky person in the field of social studies. And some may say that what I've got to teach you, basically, uh, we can probably do in about five minutes. So, yes, the title is a little uh, take on the Beatles hit with a little help from my friends. Um, it really should be with a lot of help from my friends. Um, I, we can teach our students twice as much if we just take the opportunity to um, do that work at the beginning, put together something that can help um, teach twice as much content and integrate it to where kids can understand, um, you know, as they're going along. So Joe, if you will go ahead and, and uh, forward for me. Bill Richardson, the former governor of New Mexico, great quote, we can't accomplish all that we need to do without working together. Let's see if I can do this. All right, go ahead, Joe. So back in the early to mid to late 90s, uh, Virginia was part of a national movement called High Schools at Work. It was through the Southern Region Educational Board Program, which if you're not familiar with, they are a secondary uh, licensing board. Uh, we are obviously licensed and accredited by the Virginia Department of Education, but SREB is a, is a secondary um, accreditation standard that you can join, you don't have to. SREP with this High Schools at Work program took a look at the fact that the top 25% of our students, you could stand on your head and spin and they're gonna learn. You don't even have to say anything, just sit there and spin. So the top 25 would take care of themselves. Our bottom 25% already have lots of programs developed for them. So it's that middle 50%. It's the kids that borderline may or may not go to college. It's the kids that would probably go to trade school, maybe into the military. And I say that here because I sit about 45 minutes from the world's largest naval base that we started focusing on. And one of the things that schools across Virginia did was to get into this interdisciplinary learning. So I will admit, this is not something I woke up this morning, one morning and said, ooh, let's do this. I had to be dragged into the arena at first glance. So if you take a look, um, this is one of the, the four person interdisciplinary lesson plans that we were forced to do. We had to sit down with at least one CTE teacher, career technical ed, and other departments as needed. So in this particular plan, uh, please try to ignore me dressed up as a, as a flapper. Um, while our English teacher was teaching Great Gatsby, uh, my colleague in the history department was teaching the history of the 20s, which was one of his favorite eras. I at the time was teaching economics. So I was doing all the stock market, 
um, the, the economy, how we went from um, the economy of World War I, crashing, depression, moving forward. And then our marketing teacher was teaching the mindset of marketing, including layaway, including credit, some of the problems that got us into the crash, the depression. So we were teaching an interdisciplinary lesson about the 1920s. Was it frustrating? Yes. The more people you get involved, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, the more people that you get involved, the more frustrating it gets because it's a finely tuned machine to bring it all together and if somebody falls behind on the pacing, you're waiting. So after about a year or so, we backed off of these four person lessons and we went to two person, three people, and it was just a matter of find someone. You know, we would go into faculty meetings. Okay, we're gonna devote some time in our faculty meeting to finding people that are doing this, that, or the other. And I'll tell you right now, guys, history is a magnet for this kind of thing. History and English are interdisciplinary magnets. People will come to us because they sort of know history, at least an outline of it. And they know what they can fit into history as they're going forward. So, um, with that being said, we went from the four-person lesson, if you will, please, Joe. If you'll afford it, please. Thank you. To a two-person lesson. And these are standards in Virginia. Uh, VUS, Virginia US History Standard 10. You see that on the left. EPF, Economics and Personal Finance. And of course, Marketing. When we do lesson plans, everybody's standards get placed in there. Joe, so if you'll go ahead and forward it to me, forward for me. So we got talking, when it went down to a two-person model, as far as an interdisciplinary lesson was concerned, um, and by that point in time, I was teaching U.S. history. I had a colleague who was teaching both the economics and personal finance, as well as marketing. So we did a whole series of lessons between two classes that happened to meet at the same time. It was fun because not only did we talk about the marketing, and you can see here on the left, you have one of our early, uh, I believe that's a Model T car. Um, you can buy it in any color as long as it's black. And then, of course, you go on to the advertising of the 20s. It's 650 bucks. Buy it because it's a better car. So we got into the whole advertising thing. Joe, if you'll go ahead and go for me here. And then we move not only into, uh, you know, the, the hidden agenda in marketing. You buy the Studebaker. Look at what you get. If you're a guy, you buy a Studebaker, you have two gorgeous women hanging off of you. They, you look to be rich, you're in a tuxedo, you can buy the new Willie Knight limousine. So it's the advertising working on the people, working on the brain. That was some of the, thing, the things that the marketing kids were learning. Um, I had a little bit there. Yeah. And anyway, um, Joe, if you'll go ahead, please. Then we talked about the buying on credit, which, of course, for those of you who teach U.S. history, you know, people got buying on credit. They started buying, you know, utility. I mean, things for their houses. They started buying houses, cars. Everything went from a pay cash at the time to the buying on credit. And when the market started crashing, people were left with, um, you know, heavy debts, no jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end, um, Joe, if you'll go ahead and forward, I would come back in and talk about the stock market. And if you're going forward again, 
and talk about the incredibly um, difficult thing to teach young people how to buy something on margin. But once we got to the end, we crashed the market, we started um, you know, going into the depression, we decided to take a couple of days and go back on what we had learned. So the picture, and, and Joe, I'm not gonna ask anybody to move anything, but the picture you saw at the very beginning, me dressed in a flapper uniform outfit, I would just, he's gonna show it. You gotta show that. Anyway, this is actually before um, we, I started getting into setting my room up as a speakeasy. We would serve donuts and juice, or if kids wanted, they could have, you know, Welch's grape juice. We set the entire room up as a speakeasy, would cut the lights off, would do presentations. I would always have a colleague that would come up and knock on the door, and I would give, had given her the password. So he or she would be able to get into the room and join us, but then I would always get one of our administrators to come up and act like they were part of the police. So we had some fun with that. So Joe, if you'll go ahead. Um, there we go. A few years later, that was your costume and belt. All right, so at some point in time, Kristen, you've, you've got to like send me that picture. <laughs> Just kidding, if you want to. Um, a few years later, I started back into doing a lot more interdisciplinary plans, not necessarily with our CTE teachers, uh, even though that every year they had to do uh, interdisciplinary lesson plans as far as their um, supervisor was concerned. We didn't have to unless we were obviously a, a part of this. So going back to my years in high school, which I'll be very honest with you, we're in the 70s. So that tells you how far back it goes. Um, I took Latin. I also took French. And when I got to teaching an upper level dual enrollment class, dual enrollment for us, I don't know if you guys have it. It is the college kids that are also getting college credit and high school credit. But I decided one day I wanted to do the Wilfred Owens poem, Dulce et Decorum Est. Wilfred Owens was a participant in World War I. He wrote this poem, and Joe, if you'll go ahead and forward it. He wrote this poem about poison gas. My husband, who's also, uh, he's now a retired history teacher, but is a military collector of stuff. And that's being polite. He had this helmet, and it's actually a helmet liner and the gas mask. So fittingly, the gas mask, when I saw it with the poem, I thought this would be perfect, but I need somebody to teach it. I can't teach this poem. I'm not that good. And I'll point blank tell you, if I don't know something, I'm going to admit it. Yes. Yay. Good job, Stacy. So I went down to the English department and I said, um, went to the department head and I said, hey, you ever heard of the Wilfred Owens poem, Dulce Ed the Coram Est? Uh, no. Go ask. And, and basically, I was bounced from person to person within the English department. And the warden person they came back to was uh, a new member of the department who had been down uh, at Clemson um, as a working on her PhD and, and teaching some there, but had moved back up to Suffolk because her mother was um, in stage four cancer. So I went down to her room and I said, hey, um, I wanna do this thing, I wanna teach Part of my World War I teaching, I want to teach this poem, I want to bring in the primary sources, I want to be able to put this together as an interdisciplinary lesson. That's what it took. I had the idea, 
I knew what I wanted to do. It was a matter of finding someone. Some of this is not, you know, the, the, the huge nightmare. Some of it is simple as, hey, are you familiar with this? Can you teach this point? She got real excited. She was very familiar with Wilfred Owens. She loved the, the poetry. She loved the idea of um, putting this together. And this is what we ended up doing. This was the start. Now, it was kind of funny because we were going through a period of time where kids thought that making bomb threats, this was the late 80s, excuse me, the late 90s, kids making bomb threats they thought was very funny. So I think we had designed this for one day, but we kept having to leave the building because of phoned in bomb threats or people leaving pieces of paper in the bathrooms, hey, we're gonna blow up the school. Had to take them seriously. So I guess it was about two weeks. We would be outside every morning, you know, every afternoon sometimes. And we were sitting here just back and forth going, do we still wanna do this? Do we not wanna do this? Do we wanna do this? And I said, you know what, it's important. It's important to me that we still do this lesson. And what ended up happening, we finally got that block, that class block in, did this poem, and about a month later, one of my students came back and said, Ms. Meisel, Ms. Meisel, you remember that poem you did? You know, the one about the gas masks and stuff? And of course, the, the kids had the opportunity to wear the gas mask, try to put it on, see what the poem was saying, everything. They said, Ms. Meisel, it showed up on our standardized test. And I thought first, hey, wow, way cool. Then I thought, oh my gosh, somebody at the state's gonna think I got a hold of this test in advance and told these kids what was on it. So then I panicked for a while because our, our State Department people uh, are not as cool as Joe and they would take our, les our license if they found out we had gotten into the tests ahead of time, which was impossible. So anyway, uh, what started with dulce ed decorum est led to, if you would, Joe, or for me, please, uh, lessons in the Holocaust, keep on going. We did an interdisciplinary unit on how to teach with English teachers and history teachers, how to teach an interdisciplinary study of the Holocaust that lasted for over three weeks. My colleague down in the um, bottom left there is holding up a copy of uh, The Sunflower, which if you are not familiar with this, it is generally regarded as Simon Wiesenthal's story. He tells the story in the front and then in the back of the book, he asks numerous people the question of forgiveness. And it's very interesting to work with kids on the question of forgiveness after reading this novel. If you have read the novel or if you work with the novel with your students or have a colleague that works with the novel, um, the, there is a movie that's, that has Ben Kingsley in it called Murderers Among Us. I don't think you can find it now. I actually have a, a VHS copy of it. I need to get turned into something else. Murders Among Us is the movie from this book, and it's amazing. So as we're going through this, this Holocaust lesson, my colleague is taking survivor accounts along the way from the bystanders, the perpetrators, um, every activity, every second section that we did in this study, the two of us had the history behind it using a lot of primary source read, uh, materials plus primary source readings and writings from Holocaust survivors or papers that had been found um, in various countries, various places. We put together this unit 
and the slide that I'm standing in front of with much shorter hair uh, was one of uh, Holocaust survivors in the Tidewater, Virginia area, uh, David Katz, amazing man uh, while he was still living. He would go out and speak to kids. He later um, put together a suitcase or was part of a, a, a work putting together artifacts with taped survivor stories that can go to uh, schools. So it's like an interdisciplinary lesson that keeps going. From that one interdisciplinary study, Joe, if you'll go ahead and forward, uh, the very next year, we decided to look into um, the parallels that the two of us were seeing. So we put together a presentation um, on the civil rights movement and how the civil rights movement paralleled with Holocaust survivors, which, which is a fascinating look at those parallels. One of our students, and this is how we even brought the art teacher in, uh, one of my students actually drew um, this particular slide. And from there, the two-person English history Holocaust studies brought in our art teacher. We brought in our CTE teacher, who at the time was teaching some of the um, uh, graphics classes and some of the, um, of course, I have a, a mind blank this morning, some of the CTE classes that are um, deal with uh, movies and such and every year after the first couple of years joe if you'll go ahead and, and move forward there um the local holocaust federation would do a competition that you could enter students could enter either via poetry via writings or by way of artwork or by way of the 3d multimedia presentations so here's some of the artwork that our kids have done in various years through this competition. It gets turned in, the kids are recognized, whether they win, lose, or draw. And we've been fortunate that some of our stu students have actually placed in the competition. So their writings are read at Yam HaShoah, uh, the Night of Holocaust Remembrance. And some of the artwork is put on display in several locations so it's getting students learning, it's giving them opportunities, and it's giving them that recognized um, recognition for their efforts. So it's a win-win. And I'm gonna stop right at this moment because I'm gonna take a sip of water. But at this point, does anybody have any questions about what I've done so far. I'm trying to kind of give you, instead of going through the pedagogy of, this is why you should do this, I'm trying to give you some ideas. I'm trying to talk through how these ideas came about. Uh, it all starts with an idea and a willingness to, to go and reach out to one of your colleagues. So I'm gonna take a sip of water and see if anybody has, show are there any messages in the chat box? I've been reading some of the comments, but. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss something. Somebody did reach out to me with a message and asked about you. They're wondering if you have any familiarity with ABC Clio. Um, yes. Supporting school-wide research. Yes. What do we want to know about ABC Clio? Is it a good research, a uh, good place to find some stuff? Yes, it is. It says, I see potential this database to be a resource to help with our school-wide research process. I'm wondering if India or you have any experience with ABC Clio inquiries as a tool to help with the integration between social studies and English. They are a librarian. Okay, media, we call ours media specialists because they do a little bit of everything. Uh, ABC Clio is very good. Uh, you can also look at C3 for teachers. They have a database of inquiry lessons that are already designed. Uh, NCSS has some that are already designed. So 
There's lots of stuff out there. All right, I'm going to take another sip here. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, c3teachers.org. Neither Joe nor I get any royalties from plugging C3 teachers, just, just to say that. So um, if we'll go ahead on forward. Okay, uh, another, um, our, our CTE people come back into play quite a bit. Another fun um, interdisciplinary unit and that's what it came out to be, was an international in, uh, trade and exchange. Um, where I live in Virginia uh, is about 45 minutes south of Colonial Williamsburg. I live about 45 minutes from Virginia Beach. We do have a lot of ports. We do have a lot of trading. Our marketing teacher and up until a few years ago, when economics and personal finance became a thing as a class, and it became something that our students all have to pass to graduate, and they have to pass the WAS test to verify the credit, um, we used to teach strictly the macro micro portion of economics. And I'll be honest, some days I, I miss that, um, but I still love doing fun stuff with it. But our marketing teacher um, and I, when I was still teaching economics, got together and we put together a, a trading, interdisciplinary trade, international trade and exchange. Her husband worked for the ports. It was kind of one of those things that just one day, you know, you're sitting at lunch and that, that moment light bulb pops on. One of the activities we did, um, does anybody in this group teach economics? or EPF or whatever you call it. How about uh, teaching the, um, the old Silk Road, the, the Silk Road trades? Anybody spin on their head like I do? That's always fun. Okay, so this works for a couple of things. We did this as a trading exercise. And anybody that wants this lesson, just like I said, my email, uh, email address is at the end, email me, I'll send it to you. What we did in this, this simulation was to take paper bags in different colors, red, blue, yellow, white, green, depending on the number of kids you've got in there. We consolidated classes, we had about 50 kids, so we had bags all over the place. And we would fill them with things. For some of them, um, the white bags, as I like to call them, we put in like dark chocolate or, you know, um, candy bars or whatever. Other bags had various things in them. Could be anything from McDonald's Happy Meal toys, to pieces of Lego um, figures, to uh, school supplies, you know, pencils, pens, all sorts of stuff. So you, you're kind of getting the idea. Some of the stuff we deliberately placed portions in different color bags, or they could be in the same color bags. It didn't didn't make a difference. So you went through this whole trading simulation. Uh, the first round, you could only trade within your color scheme. That was like domestic trading. The next time, you could trade with a different color, but you couldn't trade with the people in the white bags. They were denied. When the kids said, well, why can't we do that? Okay, this is like trading with Cuba. This is like trading with Iran or Iraq. I can't remember which one at the time we were like not trading with. Just, you know, North Korea. 
These are the countries you're not allowed to trade with. And I would always usually say Cuba because the kids heard a lot more about Cuba than they would you know, hear about obviously North Korea. So finally, I allowed them one trade and, and you don't tell the kids how many times you're trading. You could go back and forth between reds can only trade with reds, blues can only trade with blues. Okay, reds now can trade with blue. And then at the end of each round of trading, yes, uh, at the end of each round of trading, you put a value. If I looked into my bag and I saw that I had half of a Lego figure, I'm probably not going to give it that high a, a trade value. I'm going to be looking to either A, dump that half a Lego figure on someone else, or B, find the other half because you got small children and they love Lego figures. So you've got to put your mind to it. So eventually, you allow them to trade with that secret embargo traded country, Cuba, North Korea, whatever. And kids found out, oh my gosh, you know, they've got something that's really cool. And everybody wants to trade with them. Maybe you allow them to trade one thing. If that specialized trading group needs something. And of course, once everybody sees what's going on, you know, it all works out in the end. So then you start talking about um, trade limiting taxes. You can only trade if you're willing to give up two pieces for their one because of exchange rates. It gets really involved. And one time I was presenting this at, um, I think it was down in Texas. And one person turned around and said, wow, I could actually take this and transform it into a Silk Road trading exercise. I don't teach economics, I don't teach marketing, but I could turn this into the Silk Road. So it's like, yeah, there you go. You've just taken a lesson, repurposed it, turned it around, and now you can, you can teach it amongst you know, your, your world trade folks. For trade too, yes, exactly. And why do I have a feeling Joe is going to sign you up for something else? <laughs> so yes, the fur trade as well. You could go back into that. Person who did fur trade, what grade do you teach? You just pop that question up. Three through eight, cool. You actually bring furs in? Because I got a couple muskrats out back that you could have. Way cool. All right, so here's a third way you could do this. You could do the fur trade, teaching colonial um, Virginia and the founding of the nation. Don't let my master's degree people know that I didn't have that one automatically up there. Yes, thank you, Joe, move forward. The progressive era, I'm going to be very honest and tell you the progressive era has never been one of those eras that I will jump through hoops to teach. So this is one that if I'm very honest, and I am this morning, thank you, Gina, um, I went looking for people. Anybody to help teach the progressive era are new friends of mine. So going back to our, our Yes, we call our standards SOLs, standards of learning. Yes, we have t-shirts that say SOLs mean more than one thing. So our, our standards, economics and personal finance, we've got several things here for the, for the progressives. Yes, absolutely, iron jawed angels. So uh, Joe, if you go forward here. Thank you. Um, when we got to the progressives, uh, it was, of course, one of these things where we took the child labor laws. And I like using primary sources when we're teaching child labor laws. Um, 
I was teaching the history of child labor laws, what it was like, obviously, back during um, the time before the muckrackers and the progressives started coming in. My colleagues started teaching child labor laws as they exist today. So we took that history, went into the current legal actions and, and current laws that protect child labor. Joe, if you'll go forward. We started talking about workers' compensation. My students always read Upton, uh, a portion of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. I became very understanding of why kids didn't want to read it if they had my class around lunchtime. But I have them as part of their assignment for me. They take the excerpt from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. English teacher makes them read the whole thing. They read a specific excerpt for me. They either design a new book cover for the book, or they write um, a um, book review. And I, I tell them, I said, you know, you go all the way down to how many stars would you give it? Give the slogans a must read. Don't read this if you're having dinner. Um, certain to stop you from eating meat for like weeks. So we go through the whole workers comp thing. These kids in my class talk about uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle among other books. Uh, they, they draw the pictures or they write the journalistic um, book review. We post those all around. Parents, when they come in for parent conference day, love going over and see these things. It's like, I never knew my kids could draw. And, the, and of course the kids are like, well, I can't draw. I said, look, stick figures are good. It gets the point across. I need to know that you understand what this reading is about and you're not just blowing off this reading. And you can always tell when a kid blows off reading the excerpt because their idea of the jungle is something that looks like Tarzan's getting ready to kind of swing on through. And you always have to just shake your head and move forward. But when you talk about workers' comp, when you talk about the muckrackers, it lends itself beautifully to go down and grab that English teacher. Hey, are you going to teach the jungle? You're going to teach parts of the jungle. Can we do something together? Hey, marketing or economics and personal finance person. Can we start talking about child labor laws? Can we talk about workers' compensation? Even government classes, you can talk about workers' comp. How it's changed from then to now. It just gives more perspectives. Maybe a kid doesn't like me. Maybe they like their marketing teacher. They get more listening to her than they will for me. But if they hear it more than once, then at some point that light bulb's gonna come on. If not, they're just gonna beat their heads on the desk. I do that on occasion. So I have the forehead. And if you'll go ahead, Joe, the next slide in this group talks about triangle shirtwaist fire. Kids are amazed at this. There's a video clip I didn't put into this presentation um, that shows, now uh, there's a thousand clips that show the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. But the kids are just appalled that people would be treated this way, that conditions would be this way. And if it literally, if my colleagues and I if my colleagues can help me get through the progressive movement, then I, I love them for it. And of course, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we do. Yes, we go into the presidents of the progressives. We go into a whole lot more. But this is one of the ways where um, some of the kids in marketing, in our fashion marketing, fashion marketing kids, talk about today, they say, well, Ms. Meisel, is this where we always hear about um, sweatshops and instead of keeping 
companies in the United States where our um, minimum wage is much higher? Is this why companies take their uh, business offshore? And I thought, yes, we finally have reached these kids if they are starting to put these lessons together with the lessons of today. They're making the connections. I, I told kids one day, I said, look, on your phones, on your computers, however you want to do it, look up how much it costs to make a pair of Air Jordans. One kid came back and said, Ms. Weiss, it's only like three or four bucks. And I said, and how much do they sell them for? And the kids were just amazed when, um, when they realized how much these shoes were made for and then how much they sold for. And of course, I always take that back to the lesson of the Jamestown company and selling stock and how that was sort of like our first corporation. And it starts to make all sorts of connections. So Joe, please. I, I've got some other uh, things that my colleagues have done throughout the years, uh, drunk driving, our government classes teaching the legal aspects of drunk driving, our AP psych class um, with the brain-based portion and our H and PE, health and PE 10, because they've got the goggles, you know, the drunk goggles, those things are like way crazy. Um, with my Holocaust unit, I've actually gotten our chemistry teacher involved uh, to teach about Zyklon B, which is a potato dust uh, agent. And as we get into Vietnam, I come back to her to teach Agent Orange. What is kind of special for me on bringing the chemistry teacher in is the chemistry teacher was one of my former students. So we get to work together. A culinary arts and my dual enrollment class have gotten together to do historic African American foods. We were doing an entire um, unit on uh, the African-American experience in um, antebellum America, from colonial to antebellum America. And one of the things we ended up doing at the end of this unit was the kids had to bring in uh, recipes for all sorts of foods. We cooked them up. I brought over the college faculty and had a big food feast. Well, kids are not going to eat certain foods as all kids are because they're just quite frankly, icky. But the college professors were like, hey, this is really cool because we had involved not only our culinary arts classes, my kids, but we had decided to kind of pull the curtains back for the, the dean and the president of the college and stuff to come over and see what was going on. Spanish and world geography. Um, back when we were teaching world geography before we moved into all the world histories, ancient and modern, our Spanish teachers loved to do the, um, the geography of Central and South America, learn, this, learn the countries, and we would just do a, a parallel lesson of, they had to learn it not only in, in the Spanish spelling, but had to learn it in English. So that's very simple. That's something you could do relatively easy. Um, Spanish culture, every now and then, uh, our, our Spanish teachers will put together some sort of food thing, and it's generally left to me to put the history with it even though, as I believe I said at the beginning, I took Latin, I took French, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I really don't. French Revolution, uh, French classes, European history, yes, off with their head. Of course, we don't, you know, really do anybody, but we do uh, theater productions, and trust me, it can get seriously theatrical with um, Marie Antoinette, and that whole 
uh, lesson on the French Revolution. Our French teacher is amazing. She's also double certified in history. So she is kind of the catalyst for doing some of that. And the cool one down in the bottom, if anybody teaches AP psychology, we also are the host school for the biomed science program. And when they do the eye, ear, and, and brain, the nervous systems, our biomedical teacher, just because they're a whole lot better funded than the Sisters of the Poor History Department, um, she gets swim caps and the kids are drawing the brain parts on the swim cap. Because we're cheap, we go to the dollar store and get the um, jello molds for half the brain. It's really cool. They're plastic and they're like head size. And those kids are like drawing the different parts of the brain. And a couple times we've done this like homecoming week. So then they decorate their brains with streamers and stuff and they wear them to the pep rally because my kids are nerdy like that. <sighs> they love doing stuff. But paper hats, yes, cool. Absolutely cool. Amber, look into those jello molds at like the dollar stores. They're really cool. And the kids just have fun with them. So, um, I mean, these are just a few of the options of things that we have done over the years. But, Joe, if you'll advance it for me, please. Sometimes you just have to draw the line. And I have principles. Maybe I'm not right, but I have my personal principles. Um, Joe, if you will, please go ahead and, and move forward. My Spanish teacher, one of our Spanish teachers, Spanish department head, uh, native Spaniard, Literally, she's been in the United States since the 70s, but you would think she got off the plane yesterday or today because she still has the very heavy accent. She teaches Spanish in that Eurocentric viewpoint. If, if a kid comes and Google translates something and it is Ecuadorian Spanish and, and I really don't know the difference. She will tell the kid that it's not true Spanish and, and I mean, she's just that way. I teach a more Anglo-centric viewpoint. So our Spanish teacher came to me several years ago with this prompt. This prompt, if you're not familiar with it, is from uh, a, a contest that the Daughters of the American Revolution in conjunction with the Italian American system society do an essay every year and it's always on columbus if you're in high school and this prompt this is the exact prompt century ago in 1912 the nation dedicated a magnificent monument in washington dc containing the inscription to the memory of columbus whose high faith and indomitable courage gave mankind a new world however the high faith and courage demonstrated Yada, 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 yada. I'm sorry, in all good conscience, I, I couldn't do this with my kids. I told my students if any of them wanted to do this essay, okay. But we had already gone through, um, because my, my DE students, my college students actually start a little bit before the rest of the school starts. So we'd already gone through Columbus, the explorers, um, the uh, genocide of the indigenous peoples, the whole discussion we get into of, um, you know, should we have Columbus Day? Should we have an indigenous peoples day? So on and so forth. And Joe, if you can go ahead and, and flip that slide. This is Bird Park, Richmond, Virginia. This was, as you can see, uh, a week ago. And along with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the removal of Confederate monuments that has been happening all over Virginia and other states, uh, people 
that went into Bird Park to take down a different Confederate statue um, decided that the statue of Columbus had to go. And you're starting to see this around the country. The Columbus statues, the Confederate statues, um, and, and some other statues are starting to be removed. In good faith and conscience, I told my students, um, if you want to do this essay, okay. I was asked to go and teach a, get what I'm saying, a Eurocentric viewpoint lecture on how wonderful Columbus was. And of course, the interesting thing is several of my dual credit kids are in that class because they're taking Spanish four. And they looked at me and they said, Ms. Meisel, how could you do that lecture? And I said, I was asked to speak in this view, in this context. And I preface the whole thing by saying, this is not necessarily the context I believe. And I told my students, I mean, my, my colleague eventually understood, it caused some hard feelings for about a year or so, that I could not in good faith and conscience see Columbus as she did because of the background of my family. My students, I gave them the opportunity if they wanted to do this essay, they could. I would not grade them down for having an opposite viewpoint. I said, in fact, it would teach you better writing because you have to prove your argument in this argumentative paper as to why you believe what you believe. But that is one of the interdisciplinary lessons that I, I, yeah, I did do the lecture, but I drew the line at, in essence, offering this and doing this year after year as an interdisciplinary lesson. Um, if you haven't figured it out, I do have <laughs> some Native American background in my family. So the treatment of the indigenous peoples was something that I just, um, I had a hard time doing. So, you know, I can't again say enough about the fact that it takes an idea, whether it's your idea or your colleague's idea, it takes a willingness to work with one person, two people, three people, 10 people. It's just a matter, as Nike would say, of just doing this. Just do it. Um, it's not that difficult at times to put together an interdisciplinary lesson because you're teaching the same thing. Sometimes you're teaching it at different times. Um, sometimes it's a matter of just saying, hey, what can we put together for the betterment of our kids? Whereas you don't have a kid um, Okay. Interesting. Um, it, it takes, you know, instead of having the English teacher three weeks later saying, hey, you know, we're doing such and such, and a kid goes, hey, we learned this in history class. So what can you tell me? I don't know, I forgot. If you do the interdisciplinary, if they hear it, see it, live it, feel it, however you want to present this information in two different classes or in a combined class and you've got two different teachers, then you're bound to catch um, somebody's learning style, multiple ways of learning it, catching it at the same time, hearing it multiple times, and you've got kids that are learning more. Uh, all they can say is no. I've gone to teachers and said, hey, I'd, I'd be interested in doing this. And they're like, nope, don't have time. I actually had one English teacher, and I will tell, I will not tell the um, University of Virginia that <laughs> she was a UVA grad. 
I actually have a master's degree from William and Mary, so we're kind of rival schools. She had the interesting line to tell me that history and English had nothing to do with each other. And I said, well, how do you teach the history of the literature that you're going to do? And how do you teach the background without the history? Ah, it doesn't have anything to do with it. So anyway, um, Joe, if you will flip over one more. Anybody have any questions? You guys do have the ability to unmute yourself yes. if you'd like to. Please unmute, but don't fight each other for space. I'm here as long as you need me. Sorry about that. Nobody has questions. Wow. So thank you for your time. I saw some smiley faces. I saw some messages, some things in the chat box. Please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm the department head, which means like absolutely nothing except I get the gray hair faster. And social studies teacher at Lakeland High School, I primarily teach 11th grade dual enrollment United States history. That's the college kids that are in the de degree status uh, at the local community college. Um, I also teach government. I will do lessons in pretty much whatever somebody wants me to do. Uh, you've got two different emails for me, my school email or my NCSS email. Feel free to use either one of them. You've got my Twitter feed. And if you really want to scare the people in my school division, you've got a couple of hashtags. They just love that stuff. <laughs> so um, any way I can help you, if you have an idea or if you have a thought or if you have a, I don't know if this will work, I appreciate it. I think it was the last chat message somebody sent about uh, you, you've got some issues with the Columbus thing. Um, to be honest with you, I live two hours from Richmond. I didn't even know that statue existed. I didn't know the other one that was taken down, which was a Confederate statue, existed. I, I just don't get into Bird Park that often. So, nobody? Yeah, fighting. Uh, yes. Um, Stacy, the reason why they're, and, and very briefly, yes, you're hearing about the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond. And the reason why the governor, and he's a whole other bundle of interest, um, the Robert E. Lee statue is on state property. That's why the governor is moving to remove that one right now. There are a total of five Confederate monuments on what they call Monument Avenue in Richmond. You've got Lee, you've got Jackson, you've got Jeb Stewart, you've got uh, uh, Davis, and you have the one that nobody talks about, which is Matthew Fontaine Maury, M-A-U-R-Y. He was a Commodore of the Seas, so a naval officer. And everybody talks about the removal of Stuart, Jackson, Davis, and Lee, but there's not a lot of talk about Maury. And, and that's kind of like people want to know, but they really don't want to know. Joe, what was that last question or comment or something other than was something after my brother lives in Richmond? Any texts that you know that portray a more accurate representation of Columbus? Send me an email and I will get you some names right off the top of my head. Um, I don't have them filed away. Please send me an email and I will get you that. Does anybody else have any questions 
formal questions for India? Now, here, here's my question for you. Anybody been to Germany? How do they memorialize people in Germany? Do they memorialize the perpetrators or the victims? Do they memorialize the Nazis? No. They memorialize the victims of the Holocaust, right? So there's a great study right there that you can take in your classroom on the parallels between how the Germans memorialize the events of the Holocaust and how the American South mostly memorializes the perpetrators of the Civil War. Maine is progressive. How long has Indigenous Peoples Day been there in Maine? Last year it went into um, effect. Governor Janet Mills uh, won the election in November of 2018. Um, and then the legislation passed in the spring of 2019, going into effect for October of 2019. I had a great uncle who was a state assemblyman in Maine in the 70s. So I'm figuring it was not his crew that did this because knowing him. But anyway, I will not take any more of your time unless someone has a question. Again, if you think of something later, please um, email me. If you want to, I am not the hero that Joe makes me out to be. I am just me. I have good people that I like that do things with me. And it makes things a whole lot easier for our kids. So good luck. Well, um, India, let me give you our, our formal thank you then beha on behalf of all of our attendees and anybody that might watch this um, at a later date. Thank you for sharing an hour of your time and your expertise. Are you doing this pay-per-view, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> That's how Joe and I get along. 